Matt, nice car out there. Oh, that. That's not mine. The Aston Martin. It's got your stuff in it. No, it's nothing to do with me. Oh, weird. The the number plate is M Ford One. Oh, that. Oh, I just drive it. It's my wife's. Oh. Uh. Okay. I. I mean, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather take the bus, obviously, because I'm a I'm a man of the people. I've never forgotten my roots. But um, she insists I drive her about, and that's what she wants. So you know, I'm just being a good husband. Okay. Well, as we are running a bit late, shall we just pop on the bus then? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll get my PA to book us two first-class seats on the on, on the bus. That's not really how it works. Yeah, you're right. It's just this whole bus thing's getting too complex. I, I, I've, look, I, let me drive it. The Aston's right there. It goes really fast. 27th of April, 2022. Balakew Estate, Isle of Man. Michelle Moan flicks back her long blonde hair and pads across the silk carpet of the master bedroom. It's six in the morning, time for her workout. She glances at her husband, Doug, checks she hasn't woken him, watches his large frame turn in his sleep. She bends down and kisses him lightly. I don't like the idea of somebody kissing me when I'm asleep. Creepy. If you insist on kissing me while I'm asleep, don't do it lightly. Get stuck in. (laughs) Snog me. Oh! If you're going to do it, do it. They've been married for 18 months now, and she's never been happier. She heads up the marble staircase to her private gym at the top of the house. Michelle looks out of the glass walls at the panoramic view of their 154-acre estate. Can I ask a question? For a kind of layperson, how many acres would we have, for example? Like, how many do I have? It's two steps to my garden wall and then probably one step either way to the other people's walls. How big's that? Well, in London, that's the equivalent of a 154-acre estate. <laughs> so 154 acres is half the size of Hyde Park. Oh, my God. And that's their garden. Everything she sees, the sweeping drive with its fountain, the tennis courts, the private woodland, all look so beautiful at this time in the morning. It's a far cry from the tiny Glasgow council house she grew up in. She didn't even have a bathroom. Her bedroom was a cupboard. She's never going back to that life. She's just got on her running machine when something outside catches her eye. A line of black unmarked cars are snaking through the trees and they're heading right towards her mansion. She stops the machine, stares in horror as the figures dressed in black jump out of their cars and silently surround the house. Her heart starts to thump. She grabs her mobile, starts to run downstairs. She pushes past the housekeeper, hesitates, scans the hallway, searches for somewhere to hide, but it's too late. Two men stand in front of her. She watches in horror as one of them reaches into his pocket. She thinks she might faint. He takes out a piece of paper. She stares at it in confusion. For the first time, she notices his police cap and the letters on his jacket. N-C-A. National Crime Agency. So not any old police, like, this is serious, right? This is the closest thing we have to the feds. Blood pounds in her ears as he tells her they're searching several of her properties right now. In relation to allegations of conspiracy to defraud, fraud by false representation and bribery. She hears her frightened voice protest. But officers are already swarming through the house. She runs into the study to see others pulling open filing cabinets and cupboards, demanding keys for drawers. What the hell is going on? She turns to see Doug at the foot of the staircase, still tying his silk dressing gown. She runs to him and bursts into tears, clings to him as officers march out with boxes of documents, files and computers. Her legs give when she sees them sealing her laptop in a bag. She calls out that she needs it for work, but they push past her. She's never felt so humiliated or terrified. This could finish her. She could lose her businesses, her reputation, even her place in the House of Lords. She wipes her mouth with a trembling hand, takes out her mobile, scrolls through the numbers. David Cameron, Michael Gove, 
Lord Agnew. I need your help. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready get 30, ready get 20, 20, 20, ready get 20, 20, ready get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. This podcast is brought to you by eHarmony, the dating app to find someone you can be yourself with. Why doesn't eHarmony allow copy and paste in first messages? Because you are unique, and your conversations should reflect that. eHarmony wants you to find someone who will get you. How are you going to know who gets you if people send you the same generic conversation starters they message everyone else? Conversations that actually help you get to know each other. Imagine that. Get who gets you on eHarmony. Sign up today. From Wondery, I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. And this is British Scandal, the show where we bring you the murkiest stories that ever happened on these odd little isles. British scandals come in many shapes and sizes. Some are about money, some are about sex. They're all about power. But when we look at scandals a bit closer, they turn out to be stranger, wilder, just plain weirder than we remember. So we're journeying back to ask who's to blame for what happened. And when the dust settled, did anything really change. Alice, what were you doing between the beginning of 2020 and the end of 2021? Um, Okay. Uh, A lot of jigsaw puzzles. I was doing some online yoga, making sourdough bread. I started drinking about 3pm every day uh, and I watched the entire series of Sopranos start to finish. I kept meaning to learn a language and didn't and Zoomed all my friends. How about you? Yeah, similar, um, but started drinking at one. Mm. Uh, got an exercise bike to burn off all the lager I was drinking. <laughs> um, actually suffered with a terrible gout attack. Sorry, I feel like we're slightly losing our weight. Why were you asking that? Good point. Because our scandal today is COVID-related. Okay, so Partygate again? Yeah, Partygate too. This time it's political. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I did like our Boris series, so I would revisit... We well, are on the right lines because our scandal today is a story about love and high politics and flouting Covid rules. Finally, the Matt Hancock saga. I thought we'd never get there. No, although Matt Hancock does make an appearance. What do you know about Michelle Moan? Oh, OK. Bras. Being a baroness. Business mogul. Billions, only because of the alliteration, more like millions of pounds. Um, a very, very public fall from grace. Braraness? Has anyone done that yet? Has anyone done it? Are we the first? If we are, it's yours. You're free to use it. This story is way weirder than anything you think you might know. It's got all the ingredients you need for a classic scandal. A glamorous rich lifestyle, people involved at the heart of government, and to top it off, a TV showdown where you admit to lying through your very well-looked-after teeth in front of millions of people at home. And Matt, you forgot to say, how could you? An overhauling of cleavages as we know them. And imagine the fun with the puns we're going to have. This is episode one, Bra Wars. 30th of April, 1996, Glasgow. 25-year-old Michelle Moan gazes down at her newborn son, Declan. He's a month premature, and his tiny body is hooked up to monitors in the incubator. She wipes back her tears, watches his little swollen belly rise and fall with each breath, his heart pounding in his thin chest. Get some sleep, Michelle. I'll sit with him. She blinks up at her husband, Michael. He prides himself on always looking immaculate. But tonight, his dark hair is a mess. His face is sweaty and grey. He looks as terrified as she does. She shakes her head. I'm not leaving him till I know he's okay. She looks back at Declan. She'd give anything just to hold his tiny hand, feel his little fingers curl around hers. She holds her breath as the doctor walks in. She scans his face, desperate for good news. But when he starts to speak, his eyes are full of pity. I I don't think he'll make it through the night. 
I'm so sorry. She forces herself not to break down. Blinks back tears as she tells Michael. We need to get him the last rates. An hour later, she tries to control her shuddering sobs as she watches the priest stand over the incubator. Peristam sanctum unctionem et suam piesimam misericordem. She grabs onto Michael for support, holds him tight. As soon as it's over, she takes her seat next to the incubator, reaches for her CD player, and clicks on Celine Dion's Because You Loved Me. She leans forward, whispers to her baby. Come on, Declan, please, fight. Stay with us. I'll give you the best life ever, I promise. Michelle. Michelle? She blinks up at Michael, sits up straight, takes in the sunlight streaming through the hospital window. How could she have fallen asleep? She jumps up in a panic, but Michael smiles. He's fine. The doctor's just seen him. He's breathing stronger. He's going to make it. The reviving power of Celine Dion, and of course, the great work that the NHS does, but... She is our one saviour. She looks down at her baby and feels her body flood with relief. A few days later, she's back home. She can't stop smiling as she clasps little Declan to her chest. She's just about to change his nappy when her boss rings. Michelle, bad news, I'm afraid. The company's restructuring. We need to let you go. What? She feels her face drop. She can't handle this right now. She clicks the call dead, hugs Declan to her. How can she provide for him now? Not just him. She's got a toddler too, and a big mortgage. How could they do this to her? She kisses her son and decides. No matter how hard, she's going to find a way to keep her promise to Declan. She's going to give him the best of everything, and nothing's going to stop her. Six weeks later, a rugby club, Glasgow. Michelle adjusts her brand new floor-length black dress. She's going to find it hard in the scrum. She takes her seat next to Michael at the round table in the club's function room. She's determined to let her hair down tonight especially after the rough few weeks she's had. She's even splurged on a cleavage-enhancing bra. But right now it's giving her grief. She's sore from breastfeeding anyway, but this bra makes it worse. There is nothing worse than an uncomfortable bra, and I know you can't really join in on this front, but it is the scourge of womanhood. I can imagine. I mean, I've worn a tight T-shirt before. It's the same. It's absolutely... You do wear quite supportive T-shirts, actually. Certainly when I went through my man boob phase... I wanted to squish them down. Not push them together and give yourself a cleavage. No. I would occasionally do that in the bathroom mirror for lol. <laughs> Why does it always end up being so revealing? <laughs> but they're for me, they're not for anyone else. <laughs> she heads to the ladies, takes it off, turns the bra over. The cups are lumpy and the lace is badly sewn. She could have done better than this herself. She's about to shove it in her handbag when a woman walks in. <laughs> I know how you feel. This bloody thing's killing me. I bet you a man designed it. Michelle looks down at the bra in her bag, then almost jumps as the idea hits her. She heads back to her table. She looks Michael straight in the eye. I'm going to start a lingerie business. She watches her husband's face crinkle into a smile. You can't even sew a button on a shirt. One of the men next to her chimes in. Does that mean we can all get into your knickers now, Michelle? Right, you're the new CFO. She glares him into silence, then turns back to her husband. I'm serious. He shrugs at her. <laughs> what do you know about brats? She snaps back. I've got a pair of tits. I'll figure it out. Great comeback, to be fair. She sits back folds her arms as he chats with his mates. 
She's been married to Michael since she was 17. She loves him deeply. They've got two gorgeous kids. And Michael's a good provider. But he's from a middle-class family. And she grew up with nothing. She still has sleepless nights about money. This is her chance to make something of herself. To be financially independent. But if she's going to get this idea off the ground, she will need his financial nous. She's going to keep working on him. Create the perfect bra. Get him on board. And make enough money to never have to worry about it ever again. Always in these stories, we get this sort of kernel of somebody's personality and, and who they're going to become. And I feel like here we've got this idea of a go-getter. She's super ambitious. She's obviously a hard worker and somebody who wants to graft. But there's also this overwhelming sense that she has extreme confidence. Because to come up with that idea with no expertise and to feel like you're going to build an empire in that moment, that's pretty outrageous. Yes, and you kind of need the drive that she's got because she's not just money for its own sake. This is fear of being skin, of being homeless, not being able to provide for her kids and all the things that would mean. So it comes from an almost moral fundament. And on top of that, she's had a really good idea. And those two things together can make people very successful, but also can lead people to go too far. Because how much is ever enough if that's your drive? A few months later, Glasgow. Tom Hunter hauls himself from his heated swimming pool, dresses quickly, then strides across the beautifully manicured lawn to his grey-bricked Gothic mansion. He's got a busy morning ahead. His first meeting is with a woman called Michelle Moan. His PA's been fielding calls from her for the last two weeks about her new company, Ultimo. He's not even sure how she got his number in the first place. Whoever she is, He's determined to keep it short. He's just walked into his office when his PA puts her head around the door. They're here. He tugs down his blue blazer over his jeans as a young couple walk in and introduce themselves. They're not what he was expecting, especially Michelle. She's tall, glamorous, with a striking long mane of blonde hair. And she's a bundle of energy. So he's surprised when it's Michael who speaks first. He shuffles to the edge of his seat, a black lacy bra in his hands. There aren't many meetings where that's appropriate, but this is one of them. A cleavage-enhancing bra gives maximum support to the breasts. The soft gel implants give a natural-looking lift, but we need money to make the stock. Tom scratches his bald head. What the hell is this bloke talking about? Is he really trying to pitch him a bra? He looks at Michelle then back at Michael. Try me again in six months, when you're up and running. I'll see where I am then. He stares down at his paperwork, pretends to read it as they leave. But Michelle won't move. A few seconds later, the bra is on the desk in front of him. He looks up to see Michelle, hands on her hips, a steely glint in her eye. When I was a kid, my bedroom was a cupboard, but it didn't get me down because I had a picture of Richard Branson on the wall. I've always wanted my own business, Mr Hunter. OK, sorry, sorry, sorry. The poster on her wall was Richard Branson. Yeah, you mean you didn't have a poster of Richard Branson on your wall? No, I had a um, topless Bill Gates. Yeah, Bill Gates is very much the take that to <laughs> Branson's E17. <laughs> You're one or the other. <laughs> she points at the bra with a long manicured fingernail. This is the best cleavage-enhancing gel bra there is. I know, because I've tried them all. In fact, I'm wearing one now. He feels his Adam's apple bob in his throat as he desperately tries not to look at her cleavage. Imagine him just saying, oh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure they do, Michelle. I mean, I, I wouldn't know. I, I, don't... I didn't even know you had breasts. I didn't yeah. even look. Ah, oh, right, that's what they are. I see, I see. <laughs> Michelle continues. Ask your wife to try it. She'll tell you. He smooths down his grey goatee. Michelle Moan's got some bottle. He'll give her that. He's always worked on the principle that a business only works because there's passion behind it. He looks into Michelle Moan's eyes now, watches them brim with tears as she tells him, 
I'm going to make Ultimo the biggest lingerie brand in the country. I'm going to take on Wonderbra. And I'm going to win. So, you going to help us or not? Am I the only one that's physically imagining Ultimo taking on Wonderbra in a kind of cup to cup, you know, duel to the death? I don't think you're the only one. <laughs> the Wonderbra 90s billboard, Hello Boys, is one of the most famous and controversial mainstream ad campaigns of all time. It was iconic. And what Wonderbra is saying is it's not just about comfort, it's about how it looks. Absolutely. And it sounds like Michelle Moan's vision is also for a very definite aesthetic. And from a male perspective, we don't even notice boobs. Do you know what I mean? It's like, who's this aimed at? Hello, boys. Oh, I thought bras were girls. You know, like I'm looking at your eyes. Yeah, like oh, it does something to the personality or something. Like what? Because that's all I care about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess if it uplifts your sense of humour, I'm interested. I guess if it pushes your politics together and puts them closer to your chin, cool. Yeah, because um, <laughs> close to the centre, like where <laughs> politics needs to be. Tom stands up hands the bra back to her and feels his head slowly nod. OK, I'll put in 200 grand for 25% of the business. Tom reels back as she squeals with delight and hugs him. Oh, oh, you won't regret this, I promise. He grins, shakes her hand. She's got something special. She could sell anything to anyone. And if that bra is half as good as she says, it'll make him a fortune. August 1999, Oxford Street, London. Michelle pushes through the crowd to the group of young people in scrubs, waving kidney bowls and placards. Michelle grins. She joins in and yells at the top of her voice. Ban Ultimo! Save our plastic surgeons! She spent her last £500 hiring actors to look like unemployed breast enhancement surgeons to picket Selfridges. She needs this fake demonstration to go well. She watches now as one of them lies down in the road. His Ban the Ultimo bra placard in his hand. An angry driver beeping at him. A bloody way! She looks up and spots Michael on the other side of the road. She pushes her way towards him when a police officer appears in front of her. Are you Michelle Mullen? She feels her throat tighten. She hadn't got police permission for this. She watches him frown. Call this off now or I'll arrest you for highway obstruction. Her heart thuds. She catches Michael in the corner of her eye, rushing over. He looks terrified. Uh, sorry, officer. I'll sort it. Michelle feels herself bristle with irritation. Ultimo needs this publicity. She plants her hands on her hips, stares at the policeman. Go ahead, erase me. I just had a baby a few weeks ago, so it won't look good for you. She watches the policeman's jaw tighten, feels her own breath quicken. The last thing she wants is to be hauled off to the cells, but she can't let him know that. She holds his gaze until he turns away. Just tell him to let the traffic through. She's just about to clear the fake protesters from the middle of the road when Tom Hunter pushes his way to her, eyes shining. Selfridges have sold out a six-month stalk. She gasps. What? Already? They can't have. But Tom grins at her. She high-fives him, then hugs Michael. Early next morning, she's back at her desk in Glasgow when her phone rings. She hears an American woman introduce herself as... I'm Barbara Lipton, president of Saks New York. I just read about your Selfridges launch. Quite a feat. Did you know Julia Roberts wore your bra in Erin Brakovich? It premiered last night. I didn't know that, and that red bra, I mean, that's best supporting actress. Supporting because supporting. So many levels. You're genius. No, thanks. Michelle hears herself stutter. I, I had no idea. But the woman cuts in. We'd like to launch Ultimo in our stores, all 54 of them. I'll fax over the paperwork now. Michelle hangs up, jumps to her feet and dances around the room. Her stunt idea has paid off more than she ever dreamed. 
This is it. Her big break. She's going to grab it with both hands, work day and night if she has to, and make Ultimo the biggest lingerie brand in the world. I wonder if this being a runaway success gives you a bit of a, a false hope about how every endeavour should go and everything should be that easy. That everything in life should just be, here's £100 million. Exactly. I just wonder that. It's better over here. After investing billions to light up our network, T-Mobile is America's largest 5G network. Plus, right now, you can switch, keep your phone, and we'll pay it off up to $800. See how you can save on every plan versus Verizon and AT&T at T-Mobile.com slash across America. Up to four lines via virtual prepaid card. A left 15 days. Qualifying unlocked device credit service ported 90 plus days with device and eligible carrier and timely redemption required. Card has no cash access and expires in six months. That's not just the sound of that first sip of Morning Joe. It's the sound of someone shopping for a car on Carvana from the comfort of home. That's a good blend. It's time to take it easy, like answering some easy questions to get pre-qualified for a car in minutes. Talk about starting the morning right. Just like customizing your terms so your car fits your budget. Mm, mm, mm. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to experience car shopping the way it should be. Convenient. Comfortable. Ah. February 2003, Hollywood Hills, LA. Michael strides across the vast lawn with its perfect palm trees and dazzling swimming pool. He squints up at the white concrete mansion cut into the side of the hill. He's hired it for Ultimo's first shoot with their new model, Penny Lancaster. It's cost them a small fortune, but Michelle insists that every tabloid will snap up photos of Penny in an instant. Penny's become the most gossiped about woman in the country since she hooked up with Rod Stewart just days after Rod split with his ex-wife, Rachel Hunter. Michael stops dead in his tracks as he catches sight of Penny in a chiffon bathrobe, feels his heartbeat quicken as he realises she's on the phone to his musical hero. Yeah, sure, that's why. I'm sick of these bloody stories about me and Rachel, Rod. It's not fair. Just sort it, will you? In her hand is a crumpled tabloid with the headline, Rachel Plots Her Revenge. When Penny hangs up, she lets the robe fall to her feet, then steps over it with her heels. Michael stares at her, open-mouthed. Still about the Rod Stewart thing though, right? But it's not Penny that's taken his breath away. You keep saying that, my darling, but you're not convincing anyone. It's Michelle's black diamante backless bra design. I believe you, thousands wouldn't. It's moulded to Penny's body like a piece of sculpture. She's just started posing for the photographer when Michelle appears at his side, grabs his arm. It's too boring. We need something better. Like that. Michael follows her gaze down to a narrow ledge jutting out from the house at the side of the cliff. He stares down at the sheer drop below. He shakes his head. You can't send her out there. She's wearing six-inch heels. That ledge is two foot wide. What if something happens? Michelle glares at him. What's the point of being in LA if we don't get the backdrop? He feels sweat trickling down his back. The last thing he wants is an argument with his wife. But he can't let Penny risk it. He hisses at Michelle. Why do you always have to push it? He watches her lips tighten. Why do you always have to be so bloody dull? He squints up at the ledge, mouth dry, heart thudding, as Penny takes a few steps out, the photographer crouching at her heels. He can hardly bear to look. But a few minutes later, it's over. She's dead. No, the shoot's over. Sorry, sorry. The photographer strides up to him. Your wife's got a good eye. I'll give her that. Michael looks at the photos. Penny stands, legs slightly apart, staring out into the distance with the LA skyline behind her. The crystals in the backless body glinting in the sun. He has to admit, it's a brilliant image. He glances over at his wife, laughing with Penny and the photographer. He's never seen her so relaxed, so in her element. He fixes a grin on his face as he walks over to join them. He's always admired Michelle's risk-taking, 
Apart from about 15 minutes ago when he really hated it. But Michael refuses to be sidelined. He reminds himself, Ultimo is his baby as much as hers. From now on, he'll call the shots and do everything he can not to be pushed into her shadow. Twelve months later, Bel Air, California. Michelle wanders through Rod Stewart's 13-bedroomed mansion. She's looking for Michael and she can't find him anywhere. Since Penny became the face of Ultimo, they've all become good friends. But she hardly sees anything of Michael when they're at Rod's. He's either watching Celtic games and drinking beers or having a kickabout with Rod on his football pitch. How old are they again? <laughs> Just sounds like, oh, can I stay a bit longer and play with my mates, please? Ten minutes later, she finds him with Rod in the attic. She stares open-mouthed at Rod's model railway set. It's a vast, sprawling city, lit up like it's sunset. The track goes on forever, surrounded by five-foot-tall skyscrapers. Rod grins proudly. What do you think? She gazes around. It's a very cool train set. Very diplomatic. <laughs> what do you say? She looks at Michael, cutting out tiny windows from a piece of cardboard. I'm making a shoe factory. Want to help? She's never seen him look so content. But it isn't the glamorous weekend she was hoping for. She'd wanted to party with Rod and his celebrity friends, not build a model train set. She's just about to make some excuse when she hears a voice behind her. Rod, have you fucking seen this? Michelle spins round to see Penny holding up a copy of Hello magazine, her face clouded with fury. The details of the divorce are out. I'm bloody sick of hearing about Rachel and what she wants. She watches Rod sigh as he picks up some moss to make an embankment. I'm going to die. It's so good. We'll talk about it later. Why don't you ladies go to the pool? Sorry, the real one or the, the one on the set that you're building? This one down here with the little Lego boys. <laughs> Penny slams down the magazine and storms off. Michelle likes Penny. She doesn't want to upset her, but she can't help but peek at what they've written. She's amazed that her feud with Rachel still fills the column inches. The press can't get enough of it. She glances down the corridor, waits till she's gone, then tucks the magazine under her arm and heads for her room. She's just settled down on a red velvet chaise longue when she gets a call from her finance manager. Figures for the last quarter are in. You might want to take a look. She opens her laptop and stares at the spreadsheet in horror. What the...? Her whole body goes cold. She can't believe it. After all their hard work, sales have slumped. She slams the laptop shut. She tries to stop herself shaking. It seems the initial spike Penny brought is starting to drop. Michelle hangs up. She needs to find a solution and quick. Because if she doesn't, she risks losing everything. And she's not going to let that happen. A few days later, Michelle and Michael's home, Glasgow. Michelle clears away the kids' breakfast plates, then furiously scrubs the spotless worktops. She's like Beckham. Oh yeah, he loves it, doesn't he, every night? I always look at people like that and think, I wish I was that clean. Not to psychoanalyse David Beckham, but I think there's probably more to it than that. You're right, you know what, he's richer, but I'm happier. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Sat in a flat full of filth. <laughs> if that's how you've spun my words, then yes, that's what I meant. She's organised a weekend breakfast meeting with Michael to talk about Ultimo's falling sales. But Michael's on a call with Rod Stewart, and she's sick of waiting. A few minutes later, he walks in. Rod's in town. He's just asked if I want to see the Celtic game. She slams his cooked breakfast in front of him. This is urgent, Michael. The breakfast or the meeting? You cannot make any decision without a belly full of sausage. Amen? She watches him pile in a mouthful of bacon and eggs. Christ, Michelle, it's Sunday morning. She readies herself for an argument, but before she can open her mouth, he snatches up his keys. 
glares at her. It can wait. She marches into the living room, grabs a cushion and hugs it. Why can't he see how urgent this is? They need to get people's attention, be more adventurous. Unless Michael starts using his imagination, Ultimo is in danger of becoming just another bra company. Her eyes fall on the pile of magazines. She grabs the latest copy of Hello, stares at the headline. Rachel Hunter tells the true story behind the feud with Penny Lancaster. She studies the photo of Rachel, her hair in a messy bun, looking seductively over her shoulder. She has to hand it to Rod. He has a type. She sits bolt upright as her mind races with a new plan. She picks up her laptop, searches for the number she needs, feels her heart thud in her chest as the phone rings through to Rachel Hunter's agent. Michelle pauses, then hears her own voice. We'd like Rachel to be the new face of Ultimo. This is bold. She listens to the shocked silence on the other end. Is this a hoax? She takes a breath. Can we meet? A few minutes later, she scribbles down the London address, then looks back at the magazine. If Rachel says yes, it'll mean the end of her friendship with Rod and Penny. But she has to put her business above her celebrity pals. Because if this works, she'll put Ultimo on the front cover of every magazine and tabloid, both sides of the Atlantic. And if she succeeds, it will send their sails through the roof. March 2004, Ultimo office, Glasgow. Michelle wakes with a start, lifts her tired head from her desk and checks her watch. It's 8.30 in the morning and the office is filling up. She rubs her eyes, opens a can of iron brew. She landed from Miami a few hours ago where she was doing a photo shoot with the new face of Ultimo. She picks up the photos now. Rachel Hunter looks amazing. She's in the same dazzling backless one piece that Penny modelled a year ago from the OMG range. She's even wearing the same Diamante necklace. That's a funny coincidence. You've got to feel for Rod a little bit. Do I? That his ex is now wearing the same clothes that his wife's wearing. Quite weird, actually, yeah. I don't know if he's the main focus of my sympathies in this story, but... Do you think you'll see the pictures and go, God, I really have got a type? She gets up to make herself a strong coffee. When the phone rings, she hears Piers Morgan, editor of the Daily Mirror, boom out. These pictures are dynamite, Michelle. I almost fell off my seat. I changed our lead at the last minute. Congratulations. You've made the front page. She's just hung up when she gets a call from Richard Desmond, owner of the Daily Express, and OK Magazine. Genius move, Michelle. A real coup. She jumps up, sends her assistant to buy every tabloid and magazine she can find. 20 minutes later, she stares open-mouthed at the front pages of the papers, at the split images of Penny and Rachel in the same underwear, and grins at the headlines. Rachel pinches Penny's pants. Rachel outshines Penny again. Who wears it best? Her eyes fill with tears as her team gather around her desk. She starts to thank them for all their hard work when Michael pushes his way forward. His face is bright red and he's shaking with rage. Penny's in tears over this. Rod's just told me he's fucking livid. He says he hopes you choke on your profits. She blinks at the sea of embarrassed faces in front of her. She was at the end of her contract anyway and we agreed but Michael grabs one of the tabloids, shakes it at her. You rubbed her fucking nose in it. You pitched them against one another. He grabs her bag of barbecue crisps, throws them to the floor and stamps on them. Michael's voice cracks with emotion. Rod is my friend. You fucked it. She watches him storm out. The room fills with a heavy silence. Michelle's cheeks burn with humiliation as her staff melt away, leaving her alone and in tears. She slumps down at the desk, 
lets her eyes fall on the image of Penny and Rachel, side by side in Ultimo underwear. Why can't he see what a brilliant move this is? Why is she always the one pushing things forward, making the tough decisions? She loves Michael, but right now she feels torn between what's best for her marriage and what's right for her business. And for the first time in her life, she realises. If she's pushed into making a choice between the two, she has no idea which way she'd jump. Across America, BP supports more than 300,000 jobs to keep our energy flowing. Jobs like updating turbines at one of our Indiana wind farms and producing more oil and gas with fewer operational emissions in the Gulf of Mexico. It's and, not or. See what doing both means for energy nationwide at bp.com slash investing in America. Achieving a gorgeous grin from home isn't a total mystery with Bite Clear aligners. Just don't be surprised if all of your sleuthing friends start asking, what's your secret? Begin by ordering your at-home impression kit today for only $14.95. Bite Clear aligners are doctor-directed and delivered to your door. Treatment costs thousands less than braces. Plus, they offer flexible financing, accept eligible insurance, and you can pay with your HSA FSA. Get 80% off your impression kit when you use code WONDERY at Byte.com. That's B-Y-T-E dot com. Start your confidence journey today with Byte. Six years later, Christmas Eve 2011, Ultimo HQ, East Kilbride, Scotland. Michael skips up the steps to the Christmas party, takes in the glass walls of the office decorated with fairy lights. He has to admit, sales have been great since they hired Rachel Hunter. In that line of work, it must be so hard not to make bra references all the time. Well, sales have been given a real lift, and um, yes, we're very well supported. <laughs> We were stressed about the plunge in numbers, uh, but now we are really seeing them bounce back to where they originally were. He even likes their new office, designed by Michelle in the shape of a breast. OK, I'm going to need a bit more info on that. Do people work in concentric circles? So as you become more important, you move from sort of, I guess, uh, under boob to areola to like core nipple. And if you've got two breasts, inevitably in any workplace where there's a divide, <laughs> there's rivalry. <laughs> All that boob one lot think they're so much better than us. Left boob have got an attitude problem. Tonight, though, Michael's here to mingle with the staff and congratulate them all on another great year. He grabs a mince pie, heads over to their chief lingerie designer, Sam. He likes her. She's smart, sassy. He grins now at something she says, but when he looks up, he catches Michelle's eye. And she's not happy. He and Michelle just seem to fight these days. She's become so suspicious when he talks to other women. He feels his shoulders tighten as she storms out. He refuses to let her ruin his night. Next morning, he takes the turkey out of the oven, looks over at Michelle manically cleaning the spotless work surfaces. She looks miserable. He tries to draw her gently to him. Let's just enjoy today. Truce? He feels her tense up in his arms. She pulls away. Why were you so late last night? He steps back, feels his eyes widen. It was the Christmas party, Michelle. Ultimo's Christmas party, which you organised. He feels himself bristle. Michelle steps forward. I saw you eyeing up Sam, and you stink of some, some bitch's perfume. Michael looks at her in consternation. It's aftershave, Michelle. You bought it for me. But she hisses at him. Liar! He feels lightheaded, exhausted. He can't cope with another fight, especially not today. He looks down at the turkey, then back at Michelle. He spins around to see his teenage daughter, her face crumpled with worry. Mum? His two other kids quietly appear behind her, both ashen-faced. 
He goes to them and pulls them near, then stares at Michelle, who visibly softens. Nothing, hun. Just a misunderstanding. Why don't you come and help me with this turkey? Michael pads over to the dining table, pours Michelle a large glass of Sauvignon Blanc. He hands it to her as a peace offering. Let's just enjoy today. He catches Michelle's eyes. She starts to stuff the turkey, a little harder than needed. Important to have stress release, isn't it? But don't blame the turkey. I need more rosemary from the garden. He drops his head, makes his way to the front door. He's been married to Michelle for 22 years. She's the mother of his three children, his business partner. Surely that's worth fighting for. He steps out in the crisp December air. He can't imagine life without her. But right now, all he wants to do is climb into his Porsche and disappear. A month later, Scott's restaurant, Mayfair. Michelle flicks back her long blonde hair, adjusts her sunglasses and smiles weakly as the waiter pours her champagne. She's been invited to lunch by her friend, Carol Vorderman. Oh my God. Basically lunch with royalty. Do you think whenever she has the menu, she says, I'll have two from the top and one from the bottom. Very good. Stop. <laughs> Michelle needs a shoulder to cry on. She picks at her grilled lobster now as she tells Carol how hellish the last four weeks have been. We're still under the same roof, but we hardly talk. I'm sleeping in the spare room. I never thought after 22 years of marriage... I'm sleeping in one of the 16 spare rooms. I've been sleeping in the left breast. <laughs> she hears a voice crack, then starts to sob. <laughs> I don't want it to be over. Carol puts her arm around her. Talk to him. Sort it out. Tonight. Michelle nods, wipes her eyes. She's cried more in the past few weeks than in her entire life. She's just about to take a mouthful of lobster when a man approaches their table. She recognises him instantly. He's the private detective she'd hired to follow Michael. Well, he's not bloody here, is he? <laughs> you followed the wrong one. She'd wanted to see if he was really having an affair with her chief designer, Sam. The man clears his throat. <clears> throat> I think you should walk with me. She feels a coldness in the pit of her stomach, grabs her handbag, follows him out of the restaurant. She sits on a park bench. She feels her heart thud as she opens the large brown envelope he's just handed her, lets out a sob, as her eyes fall on the photo of Michael holding hands with Sam. She looks at another of them kissing. Her hands shake as she puts the photos back in the envelope. She manages to get to her feet, but she feels like she might pass out at any minute. She grabs her phone and books a seat on the first flight back to Glasgow. A few hours later, she marches up to Michael in the kitchen. Her heart pounds as she thrusts the envelope at him. You bastard! You've been seeing her behind my back the whole time! She watches him turn grey as he stares down at the photos. She feels blood pound in her head, grabs her keys, marches outside. She scratches the keys along his porch as he runs towards her in panic. No, no! Not my car! That's how I get to my playdates with Rod! She stares at him defiantly. You're lucky I didn't set fire to it, you fucker! He opens the Porsche door, jumps in, yells at her. You pay for this! Every fucking penny! He screeches away. Her eyes narrow, her fists ball in fury. Her marriage might be over, but this war has just begun. From now on, she's going to do everything she can to make Michael's life a complete and utter misery. She's going to show people who is the real brains behind Ultimo? A few months later, Michelle and Michael's house, Glasgow. Michelle stirs her coffee, watches Michael fix his tie in the mirror. She's sick of him still living here, 
She's just had to pay him £8,000 for the damage to his Porsche. They can hardly say a few words to each other without it exploding into a huge argument. What a healthy environment for everyone involved. It's not like they've not got anywhere else they could live. You stay in the right breast, I'll stay in the left breast. And to top it all, he's going to a wedding today with his new girlfriend, Sam. Michelle has had enough. I want you to move out. Take your things and move in with Sam. I can't live like this, Michael. He spins around, shrugs, turns back to the mirror. It's my house as well as yours. I'm not going anywhere. Make me a coffee, will you? Michelle feels her cheeks burn. She's given this man everything for the past 22 years, and now he's treating her like this. She's about to explode when she spots something on the shelf. She smiles. No problem. She heaps coffee into his mug, checks over her shoulder to make sure he's not looking, then grabs a bottle of laxatives. Oh, my God. We've got ours in lovely Kilner jars. <laughs> For guests to enjoy, like an imperial mint at the end of a meal. <laughs> she stirs them in quickly and sits back to watch him drink it. When he's done, she smiles. Have a nice time. As soon as he's gone, she grabs a pair of scissors. She runs into the bedroom and cuts the bum out of his designer boxer shorts. She pulls the covers back on his bed and grabs a bucket. Fills it with water, tips it onto the mattress, then makes up the bed as if nothing's happened. Why is this Home Alone the Divorce Edition? <laughs> she puts marbles all over the floor. <laughs> She's just dumped his favourite cufflinks in the bin when her mobile goes. She hears Michael's furious voice yelling at her. What the fuck did you put in my coffee, Michelle? She hangs up, giggles. He started this battle, but she's determined to win it. Next day, she's at her desk in her breast-shaped open-plan office. She's just about to call in her design team when the whole place falls silent. She looks up as Michael walks towards her. He sits down, slides a piece of paper over the desk. Did you know there was a floating share in the company? She shakes her head. Sorry to not be up on my company structures, but what exactly does that mean? So her and Michael own just under half each, but there is another share out there on the stock market that Michelle was not aware of. Michelle watches a smile spread across her husband's face. Well, I... Just bought it. She looks down at the contract, tries to read it, but the words are swimming in front of her. She breaks into a cold sweat, looks up at her husband. Her mouth is dry, her eyes fill with tears. She watches Michael grin triumphantly. That's right, Michelle. I own one more share than you. He leans in closer. That means ultimate is mine. She feels her lips tremble. Her whole body shakes. He can't do this. He can't take the company from her. Ultimo was her idea. She's put everything into it. She can't imagine her life without it. She watches, horrified, as he points a finger at her and booms out in his best Alan Sugar voice, you're fired! From Wondery and Samistat Audio, this is the first episode in our series, Michelle Moan. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all of our dramatisations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read My Fight to the Top by Michelle Moan, the Interview, Baroness Moan and the PPE Scandal by Mark Williams Thomas, and Investigations into Michelle Moan for The Guardian by David Conn. British Scandal is hosted by me, Alice Levine. And me, Matt Ford. British Scandal is a production of Wondery and Samistat Audio. Written by Karen Laws. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Matt Ford. Our story editor is James Maniak. Sound design by Rich Evans. For Samizdat, our producer is Chika Ayres. Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. 
for Wondery. Our series producer is Theodora Leloudis and our managing producer is Rachel Sibley. Executive producers for Wondery are Estelle Doyle, Chris Bourne, Jessica Radburn and Marshall Lewin. Enhance your listening experience with Wondery Plus. Enjoy ad-free listening, exclusive content, binges, and more. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. Do you ever wonder what your teenager is going through when they're preparing to leave home and enter the real world? I'm Shimoliai, and in my new podcast, The Competition, I'll give you an inside look into the pressures and expectations high school girls have to face. I think I need to make a good first impression, or at least an impressive first impression. We're going to follow 50 teenage girls as they spend two weeks in Mobile, Alabama, competing in the largest cash scholarship competition exclusively for high school girls. You'll hear the silly, intimate moments. Why are you so amazing? Like, I want to be you guys. And the anxiety that comes with being an ambitious girl in America. My whole life I've told myself that I need to be a 35-year-old professional. Is the pressure too much to handle? From Pineapple Street Studios and Wondery, this is The Competition. Follow The Competition on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge all episodes of The Competition early and ad-free right now by joining Wondery+. Plus.